Hello and welcome back to Data News of the Week. The video will be go through all the little bits and bobs of news that have covered the stories of data that we've not squeezed into any other videos. And this week, we've got a real mixed bag to go through. So let's go straight into the most depressing story straight away. Um, if you are a Virgin Internet user, and I am one as well, you may want to know about this. There was a vulnerability, a day one vulnerability on a series of router devices provided by Virgin. This is a zero day vulnerability that was reported by FIDUS Information Security two years ago directly to Virgin. And it's centered around the idea of your internet IP. So not your local IP, even if it was hidden behind a VPN, one of many, many, many kind of top tier VPNs that we all use, there was a way to get around it by directing a user to a certain site. Now, it's not easy to do and there's by no means this is a common case scenario but when you think about spam bots and redirections and pop-ups it's actually not that difficult to understand but the real takeaway from this isn't just this zero day vulnerability being inside uh, the router provided by your internet service provider and this is the um aris tg2492 and yes i am looking at my notes there but if you, they're saying it potentially could be others. This is uh, FIDUS telling other people. Um, and they reported this to Virgin two years ago. And Virgin requested one year to investigate this, uh, to put a fix out there before it went into public knowledge, which can often, with a vulnerability, uh, make it more you know attacked. So that's quite an understandable statement. But even after that year, when they were poked and prodded and contacted uh, by FIDUS, they didn't really respond in any way to this point where they felt it necessary to make this public and known to people. Now, as it stands, it looks from what we're seeing here based on the stories that we've read so far, um, that it looks like Virgin have not resolved this on these devices. But again, this is quite a low risk thing we're looking at here, but it's still something I think it's kind of crappy that they didn't inform people a little bit quicker than this. I understand they're gonna look into it and make sure they can shore things up so someone can, no one can take advantage of it if it gets public. But two years and claiming silence, Ta, ta, ta. Next, a number of you brought this to my attention from Elect Gear. They are now the second company to um, produce or at least show off to the market a PS5 designed heatsink. And we've already talked about the Sprint one a whole ton. I'm not going to talk about it anymore here. But the uh, uh, Elect Gear, much more expensive heatsink, has to be said, currently being listed on US retailers um, for around $35 without tax and without delivery. So I reckon it's gonna get rolled in closer to 50. That is a lot to pay for a heat sink, given that the majority of heat sinks, even you know pretty enterprise ones, knock around for about $20, $25 at the top there. What makes this one so good? Well, I haven't physically got one yet. I have ordered one as well. I'm sure I'm using the one on screen uh, with my purchase there. This heat sink, it's um, much and much larger and wider and it uh, takes up a greater deal of surface area outside of the primary M2 bay to capitalize on the cooling air passing through it. It should be mentioned as well that it's got that copper pipe through the middle, something we've not really seen. A lot of enterprise heat sinks do take advantage of copper piping to act for assisted heat dissipation. This features in it in a through line that will run directly over the M2 SSD, but again, there isn't that much out there about this. With a release date of early December, a lot of us are kind of like, how real is this? Because the Leggear have been making accessories for consoles for a long time, but that's a long, long, long delivery window. And if you do look at the Amazon's uh, webpage over in the US, scroll to the bottom, there is a review for it uh, out from the east there, but it feels, something feels off. I'm sure it's real, but again, I'm not urging you after watching this video to go out and buy it. I would still wait until you see more information about it. If I hear more about it, I'll let you guys know if I've got something more formal to go on. But for now, keep it on your radar, but maybe keep it a pinch at arm's length for now. Next up, for those that are looking at their watch all the time or pulling sheets off the calendar and wondering when are the new Synologies going to arrive, We've actually seen our first 2022 release from Synology Land. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a fairly dull one. It's enterprise, it's useful, it has a place in their storage portfolio, but it has to be said, it's super dull. It's the RX1222 
SAS. It's their SAS 12 bay expansion device. Um, it takes advantage of both SAS and SAR hard drives. Unsurprisingly, um, as with a growing trend of the more recent enterprise releases, the compatibility sheets um, are largely targeted towards their own ranges of um, SATA and uh, SAS based enterprise hard drives, the H8T and the H8S series there. And again, this is a two PSU expansion device that is supported by the majority of the 20 and 21 series of SAS uh, and SATA based enterprise rack mount models from them to be used in a big cluster of devices. This is still the first release we've really seen in their NAS systems of the 2022 series of devices. We were kind of assuming and hoping it would be like a Play or a J or something mid-range, something with a new ARM-based processor perhaps, even if they'd alluded a little bit to the Plus series getting some upgrades there because of the whole Ryzen stuff that's gone by. But still, nonetheless, this is a pleasing sign that we're seeing um, a 2022 series start to kind of show itself and I think we will see a lot more Enterprise stuff at the start of the year in Q1 2022, so hold on to your hats. Finally, it feels like something that happens every year, but USB IF, kind of the foundation there that is kind of like the over, overarching, all-seeing eye of USB, is still trying to keep things as clear as possible, and they got so close with USB-C, but as we see it sprawling out of control, and as they adapt different things from Thunderbolt 4 to the talking of Thunderbolt 5, uh, there in the background there, slightly secretly, we're seeing more and more kind of divergences within USB that's making it more complex. And USB IF has produced a document there on my screen, but hopefully on screen for you guys, trying desperately to clear things up with regards to performance, to do with uh, power utilization, compatibility, and coming up with these new logos to help people differentiate the cables and the hardware to make sure they don't bottleneck themselves. So. If you are looking at a USB-C device, and let's face it, you probably are right now, uh, the EU is trying to, is making it mandatory now within their operating area that devices utilize their, because of so much cable waste with proprietary connections, capitalizing heavily on USB-C being uniform across all devices, which is good, but at the same time, not all USB-C is built equally. Indeed, look at USB 3 or USB 3.1 or USB 3.2 Gen 1 or USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2 or USB 4. All of those that I've spoke about that have come out in the last three years, those naming convention changes in between, all of those were technically USB 3 in one shape or form, and they all had different power delivery systems, they all had different performance benchmarks, they were a mess. USB-C has turned into this multi-headed behemoth where all the cables look the same, but they're not. So, on the one hand, I applaud USB IF, really trying to crack down on the logo convention here. I don't think that's really the answer, because you might have two devices with the top tier USB um, 3.2 Gen 2 X2 or USB 4 connections, but at the same time, if you're using the wrong cable, instant bottleneck, and that works uh, all the way around as well. So it's still not as clear as it can be. So as much as I'm liking the whole logo thing, it does seem a little bit like a plaster on a gunshot wound. But this has been Data News of the Week. The video will be covering all the news of the week in one big bite-sized chunk. If you enjoy watching these videos, click like. It helps me understand. Click subscribe or click the bell to be notified about future Data News of the Week videos. Next week, we're going to be quite NAS heavy, so stay tuned for that one. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.